okay. Thank you, John. Those are actually some incredible words spoken by the prophet Hosea. And um, I guess it was the year before last, and on Sunday night, we went through the book of Hosea. I've been wanting to go through the Old Testament in particular areas. If you've noticed, we have been looking at Old Testament characters and Old Testament scripture over the last, as soon as summer started. And so we want to continue through that and just kind of look at the Old Testament. Um, we are a New Testament church. Uh, we are New Testament in many contexts, particularly New Testament in Scripture, but also New Testament that we uh, are of the church, the body of Christ. We meet on Sunday mornings. We don't practice the Old Testament law. So predominantly or primarily, we spend most of our time in the New Testament. But it's good to be in the Old Testament. And I'm excited about being in the Old Testament this summer. And uh, I hope that the Lord is, is going to give us great blessing as we look at it's some of the areas in the Old Testament that we may not be familiar with, some we are familiar with, but it's always good to go through the Old Testament so we can kind of get a rounded uh, view and a rounded understanding of Scripture concerning what we believe and what we know about our God, the one and true and only living God. Amen. Uh, this morning we're looking at the, the context of love, the topic of love, in the context of love never failing, of course. Love never fails in, in Hosea. And without spending too much time, Hosea was a prophet during the divided kingdom. If you know Old Testament history, you know that uh, the, the nation of Israel divided between uh, Israel and, and Judah. Judah stayed down south. Israel went north. There were 10 and 12 tribes, or 10 and 2 tribes, making up 12 tribes. There was a division. Uh, after Solomon's death, and some of, one of his sons took the southern kingdom, I believe, and uh, so Rehoboam stayed south, and Jeroboam kind of rebelled against his leadership, and they went north. And you can remember it that way. Rehoboam remained, Jeroboam jumped. He went north. And so there was the divided kingdom at the time, and Hosea is a prophet at that time during the divided kingdom, and he's speaking to Israel and Judah, Ephraim, kind of a general statement of them. Ephraim was part of that tribe, part of that group of people, and so you see those terms being referred to there, Ephraim, Israel, Judah. They're being used synonymously. And it's all God's people in the time of Hosea. He gets to chapter 11 and he's, he's describing, I think he's wanting to encourage his people because the, the beginning chapters are talking about God's judgment as a result of Israel's idolatry. Israel falling away from the Lord. Israel not walking with God. Israel uh, dabbling with more than dabbling, she's in, in, in complete um, worship and idols. And God is not happy with idolatry at all. Not in the Old Testament context, nor in your life or my life. He doesn't like when we put anything above Him or make anything in our life more important than Him. And when we become obsessed, that's a term we use in today's world, with things other than God. There's only one thing we can be obsessed with that uh, is okay with the Lord, and, and that's Him. That's Him. I was going to say He. But that's him. God is okay with you being obsessed with him and his word. He's not okay with you being obsessed with anything other than that. And so Israel was finding themselves away from the one and true God, the only living God, and following false gods. And a judgment was coming. Judgment had come. Judgment was coming. And more judgment was coming. And the Lord wanted to encourage them and remind them that he loved them. And although they weren't loving him, he was loving them because God's love never fails. So Jonathan's already read the chapter. We're going to try to work our way through some of the verses in the chapter. And, and, and uh, we're going to start in verse 1 of, chap of the chapter, chapter 11. And be it begins a new message in uh, Hosea. Something is changing now. It's becoming a little more positive. It's becoming a little more encouraging it's not so doomsday, not so judgment's coming, repent, or greater judgment's coming. You think the judgment that you saw when the locusts came in and wiped out the ground was bad. It could get worse if you don't repent. Now things are changing and things are looking better, and the Lord is reminding them again, like I said, that Israel, God has a plan for Israel. He still does today, even though Israel is on the shelf and we're in a, a dispensation of the church, a different dispensation. God is not done with Israel. 
And just to be theologically correct, the church hasn't replaced Israel. Uh, some people believe that it's called uh, replacement theology. Uh, no, the church is not Israel. Or it doesn't replace Israel. The church is the church, the bride of Christ. Israel is, is Israel. God's chosen. And he's got a plan for Israel, and he's got a plan for the church, and that will all come together in the end, and we'll see that when we get to the end of the chapter. But the whole, the whole of the chapter describes how the Lord saw Israel as a rebellious son at the beginning there, and dealt with him, his rebellious son. I refer to Israel all the time in the feminine, her, uh, but he's referring to the Lord here, in, or the Lord is referring to Israel here in the context of masculinity or a son, and he deals with him with persistent or unfailing love. Persistent or unfailing love. That, that's the kind of love that never fails. It's always there. It never gives up. God's love never gives up. Amen? Should be able to get a big witness for that, right? God's love never gives up. You and I may give up. People give up on marriage. They say, I don't love her anymore. I don't love him anymore. And they walk away from their marriage. God doesn't walk away from these kind of things. If you know the story of Hosea, Hosea married a woman named Gomer. What a name, huh? When you think of Gomer, what do you think of? Who do you think of? Yeah, Gomer Pyle, right? A woman by the name of Gomer. God told him to marry Gomer, and I would have said, wait a minute, are you sure? It's by the name Gomer. So he's married to this woman. She actually becomes an adulteress and prostitutes herself. And while she's in the, in the uh, um, I don't want to say occupation, but I guess that's what that is, when she's involved in her, uh, her adultery and her idolatry and her prostitution, God tells Hosea to go and marry her, or go and bring her back. Go and bring her back to him. And that is a picture of God's love for Israel. Israel had prostituted herself by involving herself in an idolatrous living and idolatrous worship. And God is saying, I will take you back. I love you. I've never stopped loving you. I've always loved you and I'll always love you. And that's a picture of Christ for the church as well. Even if the church is rebellious and not as it should be, the Lord will do all he can to bring her back to him in complete righteousness. Um, And we see that here. So, unfailing love, persistent love, love that never fails. And I thought of Paul's words and explanation of what divine love looks like in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So I thought we could just go there for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and take a look at what... And remember, Paul is talking about God's love. God's love for Israel, God's love for the church, God's love for you and I. And... When we, you know, every time we look at this passage on love, it's always quite convicting, isn't it? Because and it's always can be condemning at times because it is such a description of perfect love, which you and I don't have. We don't love perfectly like God loves perfectly. Um, I, I think there are times in our lives when we get close to that, loving perfectly as Christ loved the church perfectly and gave His life for her as God loves Israel perfectly. Um, But in reality, you and I fall very short of that. That's because God's word is perfect, and what God puts before his people is perfection. And he does require us to be that way, but he knows that we're 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 a work in progress, right? Someday we will love perfectly as we should. Notice verse 4, 1 Corinthians 13. Love suffers long and is kind. Love suffers long and is kind. This is what we're seeing with God in the, in the chapter in Hosea 11. God is suffering long, long suffering and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. If you think of that in the context of husband and wife and wife and husband, sometimes husbands can be rude to their wives. And... Uh, of course, Susan's never rude to me, but I am sometimes rude to her. Um, it does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. Already we're beginning to realize that this love is obviously a love of God and that which is of the Spirit. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, primarily the truth of God's Word. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and then most specifically, this morning, verse 8, it just doesn't fail. Love, this kind of love you can rely on 110%. Right? 
or 120% or however you want to say that. This is the kind of love that never fails. And I have to say that Hosea chapter 11 is all about the Lord's unfailing or never dying love. And of all the chapters, I could, first people, and all the chapters that I could have chose out of uh, the book of Hosea, I, ch- I believe I was led to this one this morning. I chose this one for the particular reason, and that is so we can get a demonstration and leave encouraged about God's unfailing love. And it's awesome to watch as we look at the passage because we see that uh, the, the love that God had for Israel was an undeserving love, just like the love that, you, that God has for you and I. It is an undeserving love. That's the greatest of all loves. When you can love someone who does not deserve to be loved because of how they've treated you. That's how marriages stay together. Marriages stay together through thick and thin because the, 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 marriage that, the love that binds the marriage together is that of unfailing love. That's why you, you, if you had a traditional wedding, you said for better or for worse, right? For richer or for poorer, right? In sickness and in health till death do us part. That's that unfailing love that is promised to stay with the other, good or bad, right or wrong, suffers long, is patient, is kind. That is all demonstrated in Hosea chapter 11. I think I've piqued your curiosity, so we're going to take a look at that. It's, it's a proven biblical fact that when the Lord sets his affection on someone, they remain his affection forever. Forever. Where does God determine that affection? Well, he determines it in eternity's past. God he t- determined to set his affection upon you in, in eternity's past. It had nothing to do with you or any quality that you might have that might cause him to do that. We don't, we don't know quite know why God set, chooses to set his affection on some and others not. But he does and he did and he set his affection on you. And when he does, it's forever. It's just like your children. You have your children. They're born into, your, into the world. They're born through the union of you and your spouse. And they come out, those beautiful little babies. And they, they live and they grow. And your love is never dying for them, even if they turn into terrible little monsters. Right? You know, oh, sometimes you could just... But down inside, that love is there. And it's there until you go to be with the Lord. I'm sure I've tried my mother and father's patience many times, and I've been slapped upside the head many times, but my mom still loves me. My dad still loves me. My dad just told me that yesterday. Uh, last Sunday, my dad walked out of here, out of where he was at, and walked around the corner. He came over there and said, Son, do you know that I'm proud of you? Have I told you that? And I said, Well, yeah. Well, I just want to let you know. It's never dying, never ending, never failing. So it's a proven fact that when the Lord sets his affection on someone, it remains forever. There's nothing you can do to undo that. No matter how good or how bad you are, God's love is on you, and it's going to remain on you, and that's in the Scripture. Now, that's not to say that he doesn't chasten or chastise those he loves Okay, let's not, let's not get the cart before the horse or get this whole idea of love out of balance. That doesn't mean that God doesn't chasten those he loves. Because he does. How many of you have chastened your, par- uh, your parents? Chastened your, uh, you may have wanted to chasten your parents, but, you know, how, how many times have you chastened your children or swatted them or spanked them or disciplined them or whatever, it is, whatever the term is you use in the context of disciplining? We do. doesn't mean we don't love our children. On the contrary. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. That's what the scripture says. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and uh, scourges every son whom he receives. In fact, the scripture tells us that if God doesn't chasten us as his children, then we are not his children. We are illegitimate. King James uses a stronger word than that. He also said in Revelation 3.19, As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Then he adds, therefore, be zealous and repent. Repent. Hosea, just because judgment is coming for Israel doesn't mean that God's love for them has failed. 
In fact, chapter 11 shows us that he has an everlasting love or a, a love that never fails. It, it shows that when the trial is over, they will return to him. Go to James real quick. Can you do that? You need to go, you need to go as quick as you can get there. Okay, this is a sword drill. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. You know what a sword drill is, right? Just find it. Don't stand up and read it. Again, chapter 11 shows that God's love is everlasting. It also shows that when the trial is over, they will return to him. In James chapter 1, speaking of perfecting or the perfecting effect of trials, okay, the perfecting of effect of trials, he says in verse 2, through four, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And you know, I don't know if you've noticed over the last several weeks, we've been in the Old Testament, and this, this concept, this teaching has been coming up week after week. The whole idea of trial and trials and testing you guys familiar with the last few weeks, the last three or four weeks? These have all been coming up a kind of a subtext in our passage as we've been looking at the Old Testament. And, and the reason why they've been coming up is because trial and tribulation is a very, very big part of the Christian life. Would you agree? Very big part. Whether it's for spiritual reasons or not, it's all for the perfecting of the saint. It's, all, it's how God makes you more like Christ. It's how you become more holy, more righteous. It is. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12 real quick. Turn there. So James says that we're supposed to count it all joy when we fall into various trials. I know that can, sometimes can be very difficult. I know that can be, some people are going through some very devastating trials right now. God is really testing their faith. We have people in the church right now that are going through some very devastating times in their lives. And we need to be praying for each other because of that. And it's hard to, to obey the command when the scripture says that we're supposed to rejoice in all things. Not everything is always something that we can rejoice about unless we have the perspective of God's eternal purpose. Hebrews twelve eleven says, Speak, speaking of ultimate outcome or the intent of the Lord's chastening, it says, no, no chastening seems to be joyful. Uh, come on, we're not, James isn't being contradictory with Hebrews, okay? He's just being real. No chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Amen? It's true. But what? Painful is what the, my version says. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That's the ultimate purpose of trial and tribulation and difficulty and hardship in the world in our lives, in this world. God is working out a peaceable fruit of righteousness. So the Lord has righteousness in mind when he chastens his own. He has righteousness in mind. He's using it as a way to train us, to train us in righteousness, to train us in righteousness. Training or practice gives way to action. Didn't you know that? Training or practice gives way to action. So God is training, 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 training us. And he's using difficulties and trials in our lives, some brought on by ourselves, some not, to train us, to make us more righteous. That's what the scripture says. To the point of being second nature. So, um, we, we get it, and our, our trials come in, in, in degrees, right? When we first get saved, we'll have a little trial. And you know, a year later, we have a little trial, uh, uh, maybe a little bigger trial. And they come in degrees. And as you mature, the trials get bigger and stronger and stronger more powerful and demand more of you spiritually, demands more of your faith in the Lord. Those children at VBS are going to learn how to trust God. And that little girl, that was awesome, wasn't it? She said her parents are going away for two weeks, right? And she started to choke up because she, was, she realized she's going to have to trust God with her parents being gone for two weeks. That's a trial for a little girl. That's serious business. Some people are probably glad their parents are going away for two weeks, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, unless you've got to go stay with your mean aunt or something. So the Lord has righteousness in mind when he chastens his own. Training or practice gives way to action to the point of being second nature. I remember when I was in the military. We've got some veterans here today. 
by the way, Veronica is sitting right back there. Uh, she's the brunette right there behind Kristen and uh, Ross. She, she was at Grace Baptist Church years ago, a teenager, and she graduated from high school and joined the Air Force. And then we had to say goodbye to her. We hadn't seen her in a long time. And two weeks ago, she crossed my mind. Random thought. I wonder what ever happened to Veronica who went to the Air Force. Maybe she's the, a general now or something, you know. And she drives up today with two children. Her husband's still in the Air Force, and he's in Europe. And uh, we're glad to see you. So she knows all about military training and how we trained and trained and trained and trained. We were always training. We trained and trained and trained again. So that when the real thing occurred, of course, war, uh, facing the enemy, when the real thing occurred, we responded the way we were trained. That's why we were training. We were always training. We had a training schedule every day. And we followed our training schedule every day. So when the balloon went up, so to speak, or we had to engage the enemy, that training would kick in and we would respond in second nature. We would just respond the way we were trained. And that's the purpose behind the Lord's chastening. It's to train us so that we'll respond in righteousness. In righteousness. That's how we respond. And it's illustrated in Hosea chapter 11. And it stems from, okay, this, this training us through trial and difficulty, whether we bring it on ourselves or not, is illustrated in chapter 11. It stems from a heart of love from the Lord. This is the point that God wants you and I, and he wanted Hosea to understand, not Hosea, but the people of Hosea, to understand that although chastening is coming, and although chastening has come, and although they were suffering trial and great difficulty, God is working out your best, your best, spiritually speaking. So you'll respond in righteousness. So your response to him would be righteousness. Righteousness or right living. Now speaking of love, we see it expressed in verses 1 through 4, the Lord's early love for Israel. Notice that. Let's go back to Hosea. Chapter 11, you're going to say, man, it took me a while to find it, now I've got to go find it again. Keep your finger there. So we have a few points we're going to be looking at, and, uh, and once we do, we'll, we'll let you go. How's that? But I just want you to be encouraged in the Lord when you leave today, just how awesome God's never-failing love is. Notice verse 1, Hosea 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So although Israel had come a long way by the time they were delivered out of Egypt, the Lord saw them still as young. He's referring to them that way. He, he reminisces of the good old days when they were dependent on him. That's what he's thinking about. The early days when they were dependent upon him. Kind of like our children. Uh, lately I've been craving to, to go. I, have, I haven't, but I've been craving to go back and get the old albums out. Remember the albums? We used to have albums. Can you guys any picture albums at home or are they all on computer? Mountains of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now I got a lot on computer, but you know, in the old days, we we have a couple of boxes of old pictures, and aren't those wonderful? The old pictures. I just want to go back and look at when the boys were small and they were little, and they were dependent on me so much more. They still kind of are, you know, but uh, so much more back then. This is what the Lord is doing. He's just kind of reminiscing that time when they were young, and He brought them out of Egypt, and. He assures them of his love, as I said earlier. It's, it's clear from the chapter that his love remains even, even though theirs have failed. Their love for him has failed. His love is still there. And because, it's, because their love has failed, he's, he's wanting to go back and remember the time when they were just totally in love with him, like the, the children were, when they were like children. Notice verse 2. But the more I call Israel, and this is kind of interesting, isn't it? The more I call Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to Baal, and they burned incense and carved images. This is idolatry. They have gone to a false god, a god that doesn't even exist, a god that isn't even real, a god that can't even do anything for you. It is an image god, that, a god that they make in their own, with their own hands. It's 
crazy. And as we've seen from, uh, as we look and we, we see from previous chapters, Israel, Israel failed to keep her love and devotion to the Lord. They went after other loves, other loves, other things that, that uh, capture their attention and their, and their emotion and their passion and their love. Other things other than Him. And here's the strange thing. The more the Lord pursued, the farther away they would get away from Him. The more he would come after them, the farther they would run from him. He would do that. I never understood that kind of a person. Have you ever understood that kind of a person? The more you want to pour your love unto them, the more they push it away and reject it and don't want it. They want someone else or something else. I never understood that. They never seem to be content, especially with a love that is worthy of contentment, which would be God's love, right? Quite worthy of contentment. They always seem to be easily discontented and always wanting what they can't have. It's the sin of covetousness. And he brings them out of bondage. But not too long after, they were wandering, straying, and desiring more than what he had given them. They wanted more and more and more. They weren't content with what God had done. They forgot what God had done. You know, things get old real fast, don't they? Especially in today's world. Things get old so quick today. Not sure what that is, but it sure is definitely the nature of man. Just things get old really fast. Notice verse three. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, right? Taking them by the arms, but they would not realize it was I who healed them. In other words, there was no acknowledging that God was behind their existence. God's the reason and the source for who they are and why they are. It's kind of like a child that takes what they have for granted. And the description of teaching to walk, taking them by the arm, speaks of a kind of a type of loving parent. One that takes the time to see the child learn the basics in life. That's a loving parent, right? A parent that will take a child aside and teach them the basics of life, which includes religion, which includes uh, understanding and knowledge of God. That is so very important. My mom gave me that understanding as a boy. She did. She, she would pray with me when I was a little boy. I remember laying down with my mom at night, and she would teach me how to pray the little prayers. How many had a parent that would do that? Your parents taught you how to pray the little prayers, you know? Prayers that I remember praying when I was in the military, far, far, far away. Praying at night. Gave me comfort. It gave me comfort. This is that kind of parent. So he took the time, the parent took the time to teach us the basics of life. You know, I don't know why I put this down. I just put a note here, kind of as an example. I remember when my dad taught me how to ride a bike. How many of you remember when your dad taught you how to ride a bike? You know where I learned how to ride a bike? On that sidewalk right across the street. There used to be some old projects. How many remember the projects that were right there before these? I learned how to ride a bicycle right over there. And I fell, and I fell, and I fell, and I fell. It was a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon. It had been a Sunday afternoon because my dad rarely got Saturdays off. And I fell, and I fell so many times I went and I hid under the bed. And I was under there hiding, and I felt something grab my foot. And he kept at it until I was able to ride the bike, maybe against my will. You know what? I can still ride a bike. I can still ride a bike. Maybe not as agile as I used to when I was younger. I don't dare look back when I'm riding, but I can still ride a bike. My dad taught me that. My dad taught me how to ride a bike. I remember him putting training wheels on and taking the training wheels off. I remember that. He determined when I was ready to take off the training wheels. I wasn't ready, but he said I was ready, so I was ready. But he did that. I would forgotten the importance of that day. You know what, and I, you know, my dad actually taught me a lot of things that I still use today. Yeah, a lot of things I still use today. Here Israel had forgotten those things, but the Lord hadn't. The Lord hadn't forgotten those things. Notice verse 4. Look what he says. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and I bent down to feed them. Isn't that awesome? God bending down, bending down to feed his child. 
This is what he's saying. I, 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 I brought myself to their level, not in the way they were living, but got down at the child's level and, and fed them that way. This is, this is intimate love. This is real parenting. Real parenting. It actually pictures the extent of his love for them. Wayward heifers such as was Israel uh, are drawn with ropes. You go and you get a heifer that has left the herd. And you take him and you, you bind them with a rope and you bring him back with a rope. And although Ephraim struggled against the Lord, he would not draw them like you would a beast. He wouldn't go and rope them up and bring them back. He drew them as a man, not as a servant, but a son with what kind of cords? Cords of love, he says. Cords of love. I guess it would be easier to say with arms of love. That's how he brought them back. You go and you get them with arms of love. It's the same kind of idea. Or with bands of love. Bands hold things together, don't they? That's what they're for. Bands hold things together. I was over at the lumberyard the other day uh, looking for some brand new material. I didn't want material that had been sitting out in the sun, especially in the desert sun, because it tends to twist and bend and bow and... And I wanted some new stuff, some new, nice clean two-by-fours. And I, I saw two stacks of lumber that high and that wide. I said, I want some from that over there. They said, oh, well, you want the new stuff. I said, yeah, I want the new stuff. And they had it all banded up. Had it banded up. They're using plastic bands now instead of metal. But they used to use metal bands. This is what this is, whole, whole idea of banding it together. Bands hold things together. Love is the best thing in human relationships that hold things together. Nothing can hold a relationship together greater than love. Amen. <laughs> You're just thinking, huh? <laughs> you don't know that? You haven't experienced that? Shame on you. You haven't experienced that. I know that. I do. I've been married 31 years. It's my love for God and God's love for me. That has kept my, and my, of course, my love for my wife, that has kept my relationship together and her love for the Lord, believe me, has kept our relationship together. Greater than her love for me, her love for the Lord. And so these are, these are awesome descriptions of love. The Lord expressed his hold on Israel as a bands of love, uh, as cords of human kindness. These are, these are healthy qualities in a relationship. What more would you want in a relationship than that? Many times relationships are made up of qualities that are not healthy. They strain the relationship. They break the relationship down. If one person isn't loving more than the other, it will fall apart. It will divorce itself in one way or another. So there's a lot of times when relationships are made up of qualities that are not healthy. I'll give you some ideas. Control, anger, jealousy, fear, force, selfishness, impatience. They're all the opposites of the fruit of the Spirit, right? That's what they are. Here he refers to them as one who, who unloaded a burden. That's how he's referring to them as. One who unloaded a burden. Egypt was a heavy burden. And out of his love or because of his love, he relieved them of that burden. He did. He loved them, so he relieved them of that burden. He st was stooping down. He's, he's referring to himself as stooping down and feeding them. It's the idea of compassionate love and care. It's like a parent bending to his or her need to lower himself to the child's level. I think too often the parent requires the child to do the bending when the parent needs to do the bending. The parent needs to bring themselves to love the child. And I think we forget that parenting involves sacrifice, it involves selflessness and care and understanding, not recklessness, of course. Not reckless abandon, nothing like that. But definitely care and understanding and sacrifice. And this is how we woo children with cords of human kindness. Well, it takes us to our second point, and that's verses 5 through 7. Undeserving love. That's all part of the passage. We see all that in this passage with God's relationship with Israel. Undeserving love. I'm not going to read the, the passage because John has already read it, but you skim it there. 
And you look as I explain it to you, with all the love that he had for Israel, it was at very best undeserving. Undeserving. This is this is always the mark of true love when it is undeserving. When you are loving someone and they don't deserve it, that is true love. It is. That's true love. Otherwise, it's conditional upon whatever your condition might be. I'm not going to love you unless you, and then you can fill in the blank. And when I think of undeserving love, I think of, of the love the Lord has for you and I. It's undeserving. Raise your hand and say, no, that's not true. I deserve the love that God gives me. No one's raising their hand? No. We don't. It's not like we were in love with him first, right? We weren't in love with him first. We were not. As it says, we love him because he first loved us. In fact, the scripture is clear that if he hadn't drawn us by the Holy Spirit, we would have never sought God. We would have never gone after God. We were too steeped in our sin. We would have never gone after him. We would have never sought him. We would have never looked for him. He had to draw us. He had to make himself known to us. He had to reveal himself to us. And then he opens our eyes and lets us see the glory of his presentation. And then we desire that. We see our sin and we repent and ask for God's gracious pardon and mercy. There is none righteous. That's what scripture says, right? There is none righteous. No, not one. We deserve not even an ounce of God's love for us. Yet he chose to set his affection on us. He saved us. He redeemed us. And we enter into a relationship with him. We do. Because of him. And we're still many times undeserving of his love even on this side of salvation, right? It's true. Even after I'm saved, I don't always deserve his love. Because we don't obey him or live for him as a deserving child would. Even after the fact. So, notice verse 5. He shall not return to the land of Egypt, but the Assyrians shall be his king because they refused to repent. This is the result of one who lives in such a way. They don't deserve such love. And they're living like they don't. We speak of undeserving love on the, part of, on the Lord's part, but on Israel's part, it, it is deserving punishment. This is what is being explained here. It's deserving punishment. We could blame the Lord after having over and again given out such love, only in return to have them you know, bite the hand that feeds them. It does come a time when tough love is necessary, right? Tough love is necessary. It's called tough love because it's never easy when it's real love. It's never easy when it's real love to have to Employ tough love. It's never easy. That's why it's called tough love. Well, Hosea goes on in verse 6. Notice, And the sword shall slash in his cities, devour his districts, and consume them because of their own counsel. In other words, the enemy is coming, and he'll make war against them and devour them. Why? Because of their own counsel. I just put a note here. Wrong and sinful and misguided self-talk. Self-talk. We all talk to ourselves, don't we? Some of you talk audibly to yourselves. I've heard you. How many of you do that? You talk. Have you heard me do that? <laughs> My wife says she wonders sometimes who's in the room with me. It's me. I'm in the room with me. That's why we're having a conversation. They followed their selfish ways, not the way of their heavenly Father. They followed their own pernicious ways, which always leads to destruction. Be careful that counsel, that the, the kind of counsel that bounces around in your head, be careful that it's not, that it's unbiblical counsel. Be careful. That's why it's so important that we hide the word of God in our heart. Why? The psalmist said, that I might not sin against God. The more you put in your head, the more God can bring back to you. And then instead of having wrong self-thought, we're having biblical self-thought. So important. They had not done that. Notice verse 7. 
My people are bent on backsliding from me, though they call to the Most High. None at all exalt him. And this kind of reminds me of those so-called foxhole conversions. You've heard of them. Saying, God, please help me, please help me, please help me. I promise, I promise if you help me, I will, when I get out of this, if you get me out of this, I will serve you. I will serve you. My whole life. Right? You've heard of those kind of conversions. You, even, you might even have made those promises to God. In a situation, you say, oh God, please, please, please. And if you do, I'll do this. Exalting the Lord kind of speaks of placing him first and foremost above uh, even our own wishes. That's what this is about. Putting him before our own relationships. Putting him before our hopes and dreams. It's like it says, delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desire of your heart. In other words, your desire will flow from a heart that is exalted and delighting him. How could you not only do the will of God when it is your purpose in life to do the will of God. Instead, we call to him when we're in trouble, but once the trouble is over, what do we do? We exalt ourselves by living for who? For ourself. We forget. Well, that takes us to our third point. I think there's four of them. Overwhelming love, verse 8 and 9. How can I give you up, Ephraim? This is where God gets real serious about his love for Israel. She says, overwhelming love. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zeboam? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. God's love is relentless. God's love is never-ending. God's love is consistent. God's love is unfailing. It's never easy when, it, when he has to give us up. It's never easy when God has to watch us go away from Him and stray from Him and turn from Him and go to other loves that we think are greater loves because they seem more appealing and more satisfying to our flesh. It's never easy for Him to do that. Never in the sense of losing our relationship with the Lord, but in the sense of losing fellowship with Him. We can never lose our relationship with God. It can never lose our salvation, but we can hinder and grieve our fellowship with God. That's always one-sided. It's always our-sided. I know that's bad English, but it's true. Even with Israel, she isn't spiritual Israel even today. Israel is not spiritual today. Israel is not walking with God today. God's chosen people, the Holy Land, the land of God, and where Jesus walked, they are not walking with God today. They are not. God still loves her. And he has an eternal plan for her. But he doesn't have to give her up. He doesn't. He doesn't want to. Even though she's not in fellowship with God. Notice what he says there. How can I, how can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zeboim? These were, you may not know this, but these were two cities that were destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah. They were caught up in the fallout. God, you know, God's, God's judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah because of the sodomy right, and, and, and the homosexual lifestyle that was going on there and the debauchery and the sin that was going on in the city of Sodom. God didn't just destroy those two cities. When he hit it, when he nuked it, I mean, the fallout went all over and other cities were caught up with him because they were just as wicked as those two. Those just happened to be the main cities. And he's saying, how can I allow you to be caught up with all the wickedness of the world? You belong to me. How can I allow you to do that? What kind of a loving God is like that? How could he punish Israel, his own children, like he did these wicked cities? How could he do that? Now notice how the Lord's response, how he responds to the thought of punishing them. Verse 9, I will not execute, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. That was Sodom and Gomorrah. You want to see the fierceness of God's anger? That's Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Utter destruction. Rain, fire. He's not going to do that with his people. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. The Holy One is in your midst, and I will not come with terror. In other words, because of his relentless, unloving, I mean, uh, relentless, unfailing love, 
he'll not pour out all his wrath on his children. Does he discipline? Yes. Is it stern sometimes? Yes. But not ultimately destroying them. He says that I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. Listen, he's speaking of a kind of anger that can only be satisfied by eternal punishment. That's the kind of anger that God is talking about here. The only kind of anger that can be satisfied by eternal punishment. And that happens every day when people die without Christ and go into a Christless hell. This is what Adma and Zebulun received. He couldn't do that with his own children. Even though they may have deserved it, they wouldn't get such fierce anger. I think both Gentile believers and believe in Israel will get no such fury. But I can tell you who did. I can tell you who received that kind of judgment. I can tell you who received that kind of fury. Jesus received such fierceness of God's wrath. He did. All of God's wrath was poured out on his son. And it said in the scripture that it pleased him to bruise his son. Why? Because the, the, the satisfaction of his righteous judgment was met on the back and on the cross of his son. And God could do a... So the Lord said, it is finished. That's what he meant. The payment had been paid upon his body for your sins and mine. The wrath of God was poured upon him. God's love thus satisfied and now can have mercy. When mercy is not deserved, God's love can never be compared to man's love. He, he says it there. He makes sure that they understand it. Man's love is conditional and he punishes in that context, but God not. Israel received judgment, but the Lord, with his overwhelming love, plans to restore her in his time. That takes us to our fourth point. Triumphant love. God's love is triumphant love. That's the greatness of God's love, right? They shall walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, then his sons shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt, like a dove from the land of Assyria. And I will let them dwell in their houses, says the Lord. In Israel's ultimate response, in Amos 1-2, it says, it says, it speaks of the Lord roaring like a lion at Israel in judgment. And he does. It says the Lord roars from Zion. He utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn at the top of Carmel. Carmel withers. And here, if, if we're to look in Joel 3, 16, the Lord roars like a lion as a way of calling his little ones home. That's what a, a lion does when she wants to call her cubs. They go out and they play, you know. They go out there and they, they don't never get too, too, too far away from mama. But sometimes they can start to get a little too far away from mama and she just, Arr! she'll just roar and they'll all come running back, these little cubs. Because they don't, they, they fear the roar of mama. The roar means what? If you're afraid of my roar, you wait to see what my claws can do, right? The roar... Come back. He'll roar and call them back where they find blessing and protection. So the people, the people will also come from Egypt to the south and from Assyria to the north. Those were lands where they had been taken captive. Remember, their sin brought captivity upon them and they were taken captive. And this is what Hosea is writing about. He's writing about this whole time of captivity, Israel being captive by, the, by a nation. It wasn't the first time they'd been captured by enemy nations they've been captured several times they're not in captivity now they're free now but they're surrounded by their enemies right little tiny israel and all these islamic nations and other nations besides the islamic nations would love to just step on israel and put them out of existence so they'll come from egypt they'll come from the south they'll come from syria from the north from the east what's he talking about a day when Israel from all over the world comes back and is under the protection of God and is now a spiritual Israel. So he's talking about, yeah, in context, he does bring them back. Israel does come back into the land. 
but this is an ultimate duplistic prophecy. Double prophecy. It's an exciting time. And it will happen someday. When the Lord returns and he returns Israel to himself in the second coming, the Lord will set up his kingdom in Jerusalem and Israel will be gathered together and they will once again have the Lord as their God. And we too will be with them. The church, because he comes and gets the church earlier in the rapture, we stay with him for seven years and then we return with him when he sets up his kingdom on earth. Isn't that exciting? Sounds like a fairy tale, isn't it? It's real. It's going to happen. And so this gathering seems to indicate that there will be an ultimate gathering from everywhere, not merely from their return from captivity, but speaking of the Lord's call for them at his second coming. And on into eternity, and guess what? We will be there with them. Just the church isn't mentioned in the context of the Old Testament. That's true love, amen? You can see it from verse 1 to the end of the chapter, God's un failing love his unfailing love his his early love what's the next one his undeserved love what's the next one his overwhelming love then what's the last one what's that his triumphant love if you didn't get anything else today get that be encouraged that God loves you God loves his people with an everlasting, undying love. And it's only love in this universe that is that way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It truly is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And how I could want love from a human that I could only get from you. I think we spend too much time focusing on, on what I could get. And yet there it is, just as clear as it is, as brilliant as the noonday sun, your love is even greater. And I believe that it is that love, your love, that is so great and so overwhelming and so triumphant. And so, even when we were early, in our early stages of our Christianity, our undeserving love, brilliant as the noonday sun, that love in us can cause us to love one another in the same way. That's your desire for the church. It was your desire for Israel, that they would be in such a, um, a two-way relationship, you in love with them and they in love with you, that it would just work through the whole lump of the nation and you want it to be so. You want that love to be in us in such a way, Lord, us yielding to your love and obeying your love and living out your love that it, it permeates our homes and it works its way into our church and the world looks and says, man, that is an awesome group of people, how they love each other so much. And that's because we're so greatly loved. The greatest demonstration of love that you could demonstrate to mankind was to punish your own son for our salvation. There is not a greater love. It says no greater love can a man have than to give up his life for a friend. You gave up your son for the undeserving sinner. That is great love. And then that love carries on into eternity. Father, thank you for setting your love upon us. Maybe there's somebody here today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. You don't quite understand that. You're not experiencing it, but you'd sure like to know the love of God in its totality. It's very simple. You have to recognize that if God does love you, it's undeserving because you're a sinner. And once you see that, then you can ask the all-loving God to forgive your sin, and he will, and he'll bring you close to him. So if you're here today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you'd like to, be, you'd like to experience the full love of God, ask him to forgive you. Just right where you're sitting, God, forgive me for my sin. I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Save me with your love. Bring me into a relationship with you. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if, if you made that, if you, if 
you said that prayer this morning, with nobody looking around, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today for the first time. Anyone at all, we just want to rejoice with you. Anyone before we go? Father, I am going to trust you with that. Sometimes people pray those prayers and then for whatever, whatever reason aren't always comfortable to make that known. I pray they would if that's true. You're so good to us. You're so loving. And of course, we're all here today with our heads by and our eyes closed and most definitely could walk closer to the Lord. We could most definitely be more committed to his love for us by reciprocating that love to him and a life of you know, obedience to his word. It's the best way you can show your love for God. He said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. Make sure you decide to do that today before you leave. The Spirit of God most definitely can show you the areas in life that you need to recommit to the Lord so you might demonstrate your love for him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's turn to 118. His name is wonderful. That's a good choice. Did you choose that one, David? And he didn't even call me to find out what we were talking about this morning. 118. Let's, let's, say, let's sing it as a form of worship, okay? You're worshiping him. His name is wonderful, amen? Ready? His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King. Master of everything. Well, you sound like you mean it. Jesus, my Lord, He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God is He. Bow down before Him. His name is wonderful, Jesus my. Amen? Brother Kenny, would you lead us in a word of prayer? And then we'll be dismissed.